Well, we didn't miss that one, did we? Unexpected crisis. Unexpected events. Maybe this last year there were unexpected people and unexpected changes. It's happened to you before, hadn't it? You didn't expect it. Well, I have a news flash. It's going to happen again. It's coming. Unexpected activity from God. It's happened before. Today, we're not going to dig down into doctrines. But I have a message for you. One that we need to listen to, pay attention to. Because God is always active all around us. And he wants to involve us in what he is doing. And if we are open and ready and willing, he will. But that doesn't mean that God's going to involve you in what he's doing and what has happened in your life in a way that you expect it. Usually, it isn't. It's going to happen in world events, too. And that's going to be a bit of our focus towards the end today. There's a truth I want you to learn, and we're going to repeat it multiple times here. If I can get things to change. Here it is. I'll say it, and I want you to read it with me. God is the God of the unexpected but it is never unexpected by God. Would you say that with me? God is the God of the unexpected, but it is never unexpected by God. 2022 is a year that I predict is going to be filled with the unexpected. A lot of it may be on a very large scale. A lot of it may be very small in your life, but it's going to affect all of us. How we live in anticipation of all of that is going to determine the outcome spiritually for us as well as even our own survival. Will the unexpected be a blessing in our lives? Or will it crush us? Will it destroy our spiritual life? Are we going to go down in defeat? Or this time next year, when we look back, will we see victory? The choice is ours to make. We're going to meet some people in the scripture here in just a moment. They also face those choices. The choices they made determine the outcome. Because you see, your choices don't depend on the circumstances. When the unexpected happens, it depends on what's inside of you. It depends on the truth that's residing in your soul so that it will come out in practical righteousness. Open your Bibles with me first. Let's take the Christmas story and let's see what we're talking about. Go with me to Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one. You have the story of the history of Zacharias and Elizabeth. We studied this in our life of the Messiah. And we find in, in verse five, in the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah who had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. Now note this in verse six, they were both righteous in the sight of God, meaning they had practical righteousness. Walking blamelessly when they when there was sin in their life, they dealt with it biblically. Uh, and all the commandments and requirements of the Lord, of course, they were under the Mosaic law. Well, they didn't have a child, and Zacharias was a priest, verse 8. Now it happened that while he is performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, then drop down to 11, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him. How's that for the unexpected? Remember that the Lord had been silent during the previous 400 years from the last verse of Malachi till this moment in time. Angel of the Lord appeared to him, saying in the right 
side of the altar of incense. We studied that and discovered that when there was the understanding of the people of the time frame that if an angel appeared on the right side of the altar of incense, it meant you were going to die. You'd done something wrong. So Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. You see, they were going to be the parents of the forerunner of the Messiah, John the Baptist. They knew of the prophecies of Malachi chapter 4. Zechariah's response tells you he was a man of the book. The Bible tells us he was walking in practical righteousness, blameless before the Lord. In verse 6, they, they practiced that practical righteousness. They knew the word. They lived in accordance with the Mosaic law. They were approved by God. That tells you about their characteristics as a believer. But now they were in their old age. They had been praying for a child, and now they were in a certain, they were above 60 anyway. And suddenly they were told in their old age they were going to have a child. They were people of prayer, they were in faithful service to the Lord. But God had not answered that prayer that they had until now. So they knew the prophecies. They knew that the forerunner was going to come. They just didn't expect that the plan of God was going to personally involve them. That's what caught them off guard. Matter of fact, Zacharias was a very faithful man, but in a moment of disbelief, he gave his wife a blessing by making him unable to speak for nine months. <laughs> a lot of wives might be singing this song. Blessed quietness, holy quiet. Anyhow, that's, that's the point I want us to kind of get. Is that you know about prophecy too, and I, I don't want to give it away from the Lord. But don't be surprised if the things that we know are coming suddenly involve us. But you see, following the Lord was costly. They obeyed you know, they're, they're, they were old, and now their whole life just changed. You know, in today's world, it's not unusual for grandparents to be raising children. It's rather unusual for people of this age to have children. I'm sure, as blessed and as happy as they were, that daily routine was pretty much gone. Now, what were they going to be doing? Changing diapers, dealing with can't sleep at night. I don't know about you, man. The older I get, the more I love my sleep at night. I'm above 60, so their comfortable nights just went wacky, washing diapers, eventually chasing a small child all around the house. John, settle down. All of that had not been expected. It was an unexpected expectant, wasn't it? But they accepted it. And in verse 14, it says it brought them great joy and gladness. So what does that say? What do they have to remember? Let's say it. God is the God of the unexpected, but it is never unexpected by God. This was in the plan of God. How precious it was for them. We see it now clearly, but try and just experience what it was like for them on scene. Go to Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 33. Well, we know about this one, don't we? Mary, she's about 15, maybe 16 years old. And it says, beginning in verse 26, do you have your Bibles? Amen. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, the Lord said to her, greetings, favorite one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. Now, why did he say that? Because she was having a bit of a sandal shaking experience. Don't you think? 
said, uh, you have found favor. You found grace with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. He's talking about the Messiah and Mary knew exactly what he was saying. Why did she know that? Mary, Gabriel didn't have to say, now let me take you back and let you and fill you in on the doctrine here. How did she know? Because doctrine already filled her soul at 15 or 16. Most of our young people at 15 or 16, the only thing they're filled with is video games. Mary said, how can this be since I'm a virgin? Logical question, not a question of disbelief, just logical. Angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. How's that for an unexpected expected? This had never happened before in all the history of the created universe. He's the God of the unexpected, but it's never unexpected by God. It's in the plan of God. The power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Behold, your relative Elizabeth has also conceived the Son in her old age, and he, she who is called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word, and the angel departed from her. What a marvelous, marvelous response. How many of us take our life and turn it over to the Lord? When something unexpected happens, an unexpected opportunity, but we realize it's going to disrupt our life. You see, she found favor with God. The angel states that she's been highly approved by God. The Greek word used there is the in all of the places found is in Ephesians 1 6. It means to be highly approved. It said about uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth that they were righteous in the sight of God. They were living out in practical righteousness. It doesn't say that about Mary, but it's displayed in how God dealt with Mary. She knew doctrine because when you go over uh, into what is called her magnific Magnificat, I can't talk today, uh, beginning about uh, verse 46, it is one quote or allusion to the Old Testament over throughout her entire song, spontaneous song. That's how well she knew the book. She had memorized a lot of scripture. And remember, they didn't have Bibles like we do. Oh, there were copies around, and she may have been able to see copies, but mostly it's because she paid attention when she was in the synagogue. And she paid attention to what her parents had taught her. One of the greatest things you can see in Mary's life are the people that are not even mentioned here, her parents. It was the year of the unexpected. You see, she was not surprised that the Messiah was going to come. She knew all about the scriptures. The angel could talk to her from a point of her understanding. Not only that, but there was in the air at that time frame, there's even some recent documents, I'll mention this maybe next week or the next week, um, that have been found from Qumran that were written about 90 B.C., about a about hundred years before Christ was born, that there was a messianic expectation in the air. And people were looking and waiting. And you see what we read from the scriptures this morning of Simeon and so forth. They're anticipating the Messiah. She anticipated, what she did not expect was, it's going to involve her in the plan of God. She did not expected. She would have immediately known the social issues that were going to come for pregnancy out of wedlock. She knew that Joseph, the man she was to marry, would know very well it wasn't his. She was a virgin. Her obedience was costly. Her whole life plan suddenly changed. She was probably thinking of, and I'll put it in modern American terms, the little, the little house with the little fence and the little bush in the yard and half a dozen kids running around, or, or maybe modern terms, one kid that they send to daycare. 
In other words, the life plan was laid out. She and Joseph had talked about it. God said, I have a different plan. Accept it or don't. That will happen in our lives too. Never forget this. The will of God involves two aspects. One is his will for every believer, that is to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To mature into Christ-likeness. That's what these people all displayed. Then as a result of that, at a point in time in your life, he will reveal his specific will to you. And you'll get it, if you will, if I can just put it in these terms, an invitation from God to get involved with what he's doing and wants to do in you and through you. That may be a big thing. It may be a small thing. It may be a huge life-changing event. One of the things that is so true in today's world is that churches are closing left, right, and sideways. One of the reasons they're closing is no young men want to be pastors. Why? It's costly. Mary knew all of this was going to cost her. It truly was her year of the unexpected. But she trusted him with the outcome, recognized it was an unexpected activity from God, and she accepted it. So once again, what is our statement? Say it with me. God is the God. The, come on, let's try it again. Okay, everybody move your lips. Let me see your lips moving. Okay, God is the God of the unexpected, but it is never unexpected by God. Do you trust him? That's the question. Well, we have somebody else to look at real quick. Go with me to Matthew chapter one. Matthew chapter one, where you're talking now to the man who was to be your husband, Joseph. <laughs> now the birth of Jesus, verse 18, chapter one of Matthew. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph and the betrothal back then was if you were considered Mary, married, except you, you hadn't come together. There was a year, you on the average, a year waiting period. Part of the reason for that waiting period was so that the husband would know his wife was a virgin. All of a sudden, Mary comes up pregnant. You can tell by his response, he deeply loved this girl. And he was going to try and protect her. But he knew that unless she was a virgin, he wasn't going to marry her. That's a sad thing in today's world. Among so many, even among believers, you know, God forgives, absolutely. Of course. But sexual activity is limited to marriage. But let's go on. Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man. Now, wait a minute, same thing it said about Zacharias and Elizabeth, a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her, there's his love, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of a sudden, he knows what he's talking about. He's talking about the Messiah. <clears throat> now, all this took place to fulfill what was written by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child uh, uh, and, shall, and, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated mean God with us. It doesn't say it this way, but there's every probability that Joseph immediately recalled that scripture. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. She called his name Jesus. The passage tells us he was a righteous man. Again, he knew the word. He was living out the word. He would have known the messianic prophecies. And suddenly, the unexpected happened. His wife to be is pregnant. He knows it's not his. He probably immediately felt she was guilty of adultery. 
because that's what it was considered during the engagement period. Like I said, it was like a marriage. But he didn't want to shame her, but he knew in his mind that she was not the one to bear his children. So he planned to send her away secretly. He was going to have to divorce her. That's what it means to send her away. He didn't expect to be told Mary was still a virgin. You know, I, I just, you can't help but put a little sanctified imagination on it. And he's in the middle of the dream in this, but it's more than a dream. The angel speaks to him. He just, he's struggling over. He's brokenhearted. His wife to be, or his wife is pregnant and it ain't his. And the angel says, she's still a virgin. Can you just say that? Say what? <laughs> what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Come on, Dave. <laughs> Gabriel, in case. <laughs> the unexpected happens again and gives him God's information about the situation. Truly the year of the unexpected, because again, he knew the messianic prophecies. He just did not expect the will of God for accomplishing it was going to involve him. He didn't expect God to pay any attention to him. He was just another guy. But God chose him. He did not expect to be the man assigned by God to raise the promised Messiah to adult. It was costly. His whole life changed. He would have had all of his plans. He was a responsible man. He knew what he's going to do to take care of his wife and family to be. Everything changed. He didn't expect that men from Persia were going to come visit his child. He didn't expect that the king was going to try and kill all the babies. He didn't expect that he's going to have to spend months, maybe up to a year and a half or two years in Egypt. Egypt. But you see, Say it with me. God is the God of the unexpected, but it is never unexpected by God. Well, we could go through a lot of things. We could look in the Old Testament. Just think about Noah. Rain. What's rain? <laughs> Built a boat on dry land. Yep. How about Moses? I pick you the one who is wanted for murder in Egypt to go back and lead my people out. Moses real happy being right where he was. How about Job? Job, a righteous man, the most advanced believer probably on the face of the earth at the time frame. What happened? God says, hey, Satan, notice my man Job. And so we have the book of Job. And all the way down to the end when Job finally is running out, proper understanding. He finally said the right thing. I'm going to shut my mouth until I hear from you. And he had a pout fit. That's when God looked down and said, Joe, where were you when I created the world? Do you want to suddenly feel like a piece of dirt? There it is. But you see, he did not know what was going on behind the scenes. He didn't expect the plan of God to be like this for his life. We could go through all kinds of things. Talk about the disciples and the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. That's not what they expected from the Messiah. How about the day of Pentecost? They didn't expect that. But it happened. What about the change in the life of all the disciples? They all had their life plans. Their wives had plans. They started following Jesus. And he made them the foundation of the church that we still have 2,000 years later. It was unexpected, but it wasn't unexpected by God. They knew what Jesus had said. They knew these things. But you see, God is the God of the unexpected, but it is never unexpected by God. How about last year? Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's bring it up to date now. 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> 2021 was certainly the year of the unexpected, wasn't it? 20 and 21. 
Paul writes this, but realize that in the last days, difficult times will come. And all this is speaking primarily to the church and the pastors. It also broadens out to the whole world that's coming close to the tribulation. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. Many times, maybe this last year, there were personal things that happened in your life that you didn't expect. We know that's true, don't we? Amen. A lot of unexpected. It, some, some of those things just upended our comfortable little lives. Some people got COVID, didn't expect it. Some are still trying to recover from it. I can't begin to list all the things. For some of you, and I, I know of different things, your life changed in very unexpected ways. Some of you didn't expect those heart problems. You didn't expect to have borders in your house. You didn't expect the, what the doctor told you. We could go on. We certainly didn't expect the Wuhan virus. We didn't expect all the measures that the government was going to take to radically change their societies around the world, including here in the United States, to gain control and power. We didn't expect to see the evil mean, mean, menace of authoritarianism become a reality in so many places, including here in the U.S., taken away free. 20 and 21, we didn't expect the rapid rise in social fracturing, lawlessness, especially here in America. We didn't expect to see our borders ignored. We didn't expect to see the terrible lawlessness by politicians undermining the very foundation of our national care. Right here at Westside, we did not expect to see the church viciously attacked for our stand on grace. We didn't expect to see people leave this church because they rejected the biblical truth about homosexuality and lesbianism. We didn't expect to see people suddenly decide against grace and leave. We didn't expect to see several physical issues that have happened to members of the church and leaders. We didn't expect to see those with such long illnesses fail to improve this year. The year of the unexpected, we could say a lot about it, couldn't we? But what do we say? God is the God of the unexpected, but it is never unexpected by God. We're on the beginning of a new year. Go with me to your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. I want you to see what is coming, what has been happening, and what is going to happen in the light of Bible prophecy. And once again... Just because you know prophecy, Daniel chapter 2, doesn't necessarily sink into us that God's plan is going to involve us individually, nationally. Daniel chapter 2. Well, I'm getting there. There we go. Verse 40. I, I could use a little extra light. On my uh, Due to my eyes, a little, I'm going to have to work a little more light up here. But anyhow, this is talking about what is yet to come. There will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. Inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these pieces. And then you saw the feet and toes. This is the, the image of the Nebuchadnezzar Saul and Daniel's telling him the prophetic meaning of it. Um, it was a giant man's statue. He's looking down at the feet and the toes. 
partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. It will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron. And as much as you saw the iron mixed with common clay, as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. Real quick, go to chapter 7, verses 23 and 24. Chapter 7, verses 23 and 24. <clears throat> Here he's talking about a different vision, but it's the same idea. It's talking about the same time frame. Here it's a beast. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth. That is the one that is yet to rise, which will be different from all the others. Now, it is it is an extension of the Roman Empire that faded away. It is talking about its coming back again as a world government, which we differ from all other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the 10 horns, out of this kingdom, 10 kings will arise and another will arise after them. And he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. Just in a brief discussion of it, both the toes and the beast represent a kingdom that is yet to come. This particular thing tells us something very significant. There's going to be that fourth kingdom. It will, it will devour the whole earth. That's talking about global governance. And tread it down and crush it. What is that? That's authoritarianism. That's the heavy fist of government. Now look carefully because it says out of this kingdom. What kingdom? A world government that is going to come. And out of that are going to come 10 kings. That the 10 kings is the government that will be in place when the tribulation starts. So what does that tell you about what is coming? Hard as iron. What is happening right now? You will obey or you can't go out to eat. You will obey. You can't go to the store. You will obey. And don't think it just stops here. Once the iron fist begins to close and come down to break the hammer, it's only until the next thing and then the next thing and then the next thing. Don't be surprised. We know the prophecy. Don't be surprised it involves us. We don't expect it. You know, I've, I've been taught prophecy since I was a knee-high to a grasshopper back when Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Moses was a cowboy. You know what I'm saying? You know these things are coming, but you don't really think it's going to be in your time. Neither did Mary. Neither did Zacharias or Elizabeth or Joseph or others. Suddenly it involves us. Go with me to Revelation chapter 9. By the way, what that is telling me in that passage, there's going to become a global government in the world before the tribulation starts. We may be here to see that government. For it to happen, a lot of other things have to happen, such as America ceases to be a major power in the world because these powers are European. It doesn't say the global government is necessarily based in Europe but those immediately stepping in behind it are the European powers. I do not believe that America is in Bible prophecy in, in any significant way. By the way, neither is China. We could go on, but look at Revelation chapter 9, verse 21. 
Speaking of the tribulation period, go ahead and read the, uh, 20. And the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent. Repentance is something both believers and unbelievers can do. It is to turn away from the things that are displeasing to God and respond positively to the word of God. Even unbelievers can do that. Unbelievers can avoid discipline of God in time if they respond. But let's go on. They did not repent. These are unbelievers of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons, the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Now look in 21. And they did not repent. Look at the big four of their murders, of their sorceries, of their immorality, nor of their thefts. Tell me how that much that describes the world in America today. I just saw the city of Chicago has set an historical record for the most murders in one year. The steady increase in all four of these can be seen if you're paying any attention. The number of murders across the nation and the world is at an all-time high. Abortion is not only accepted, but is being promoted as something demonstrating woman's liberation and social responsibility. Let's murder the children. Dramatic increases of drug use. That's what it says there are sorceries. Hallucinogens of every kind, including marijuana, is a connection to the world of the demonic. Remember, all pagan religions throughout, you can go back as far as you want, they use various drug substances to connect with the world of the demonic, the spiritual world. Do not think it is neutral. It is not. Many of the other things that people get through prescriptions or off the streets or wherever else, open them up to the world, the demonic. And it is as dangerous as anything can be dangerous. A steady rise in witchcraft, let's just say, goes with that sorceries of witchcraft, shamanism, new age ideology, demonic activity. What demonic activity can I suggest you with us? Demonic activity. Immorality. They didn't re report, repent of their immorality. What is immorality? It's sex outside of marriage. A promotion of it. What is happening right now in America, for example, in their steady promotion of homosexual marriage and praising it and, you know, if you oppose it, you're, you're a danger to society. Sex outside of marriage, unfortunately, is common even amongst Christians. Now, remember, we're not talking about sins that have been confessed or things that happened before a person was a believer. We're talking about Christians accepting it as okay and normal, including bearing children out of wedlock without shame. Again, as we're not talking about believers who have repented or those where these things happen in their life before they were saved. But we can't affirm it. We can't affirm it. Don't buy into the popular Christmas marriage about Mary, about how wonderful it is for unwed marriage. That's not what it's talking about. Homosexuality, every sort of sexual perversion is celebrated, even in churches, women and men dressing with open immodesty, even among believers. How about thievery? Thievery is now called equity. Lawlessness. Remember one of the terms for the man of sin, the Antichrist? He's the man of lawlessness. We know Bible prophecy, don't we? We know the tribulation is coming. 
We just don't expect it's going to hit us because we live every day as if it's going to be the same tomorrow as it was yesterday. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. And I hurry. We studied this, but I just want to come back and mention it to you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from, is the translation, it is a better translation, through the hour of testing. That hour which is about to come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly, hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. That testing is not the tribulation period. That is an event of a time frame that is coming to the world prior to the tribulation period. It is testing those who dwell on the earth, the earth dwellers, the unbeliever. How is it testing them about the kind of pressure that they're going to put onto believers? That's why the very next verse says, I'm coming quickly. Don't let anyone take your crown. What's the crown? Go to chapter two and verse 10. Chapter two and verse 10. Do not, and I believe this refers to the very tail end of this tribulation period. Uh, not the tribulation, but the time for the church, the time that is, I believe, very close upon us. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. You will have tribulation for 10 days. Either that's a literal 10 days or I believe it speaks more figuratively of the end of the church age. Be faithful in the death, and I'll give you the crown of life. What's the crown of life? The right to rule and reign with Christ. You have to be faithful in the death. That's the crown we can lose. The year of the unexpected. We know these things. We've taught these things. We just really didn't think that it was going to involve us. We didn't really think that we're in the shadows of the tribulation period. Let's close with this. How do we get through the going through First Timothy? Right back to where we were a moment ago. A little later in what Paul writes to Timothy. Second Timothy, excuse my typo. Second Timothy chapter three. Right after he got through talking to Timothy about the tough times that are going to come, look down at verse 12. He said, indeed, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and imposters will perceive from, proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's not going to get better. How do we respond? You, however, Paul writes to Timothy, continue in the things which you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. What was he taught? The sacred writings. It's the Old Testament, but it was the sacred writings. He knew them. Paul had trained him personally. It's the word of truth. It's Bible doctrine. But you see, you cannot continue in something if you're not going somewhere. You know, it's like a person saying, well, I'm continuing on my trip. Oh, really? What time did you leave? You haven't left yet. Does somebody have a little breakdown in synapsis or something? You cannot continue in doctrine. You cannot continue growing if you aren't already on the path. Remember what we said? The people that Timothy never expected in his life, he was going to wind up being a pastor and in a pretty, pretty tough church. God had a plan for his life. He was living out the word. He had Paul kept saying, remember what you've been taught? Stay the course. In spite of what he just said about tough times and all the previous verses of that chapter. <laughs> But what was the foundation of it? Well, first off, he says the wisdom that leads to salvation. He's not talking about phase one salvation. He's talking about soul salvation. He's talking about those things where Timothy will be successful in time 
by walking in obedience even in tough times. See, God is developing his co-heirs. How does he do that? He does that by letting you go through many tough things, things that you didn't expect, things that you never thought were going to go this way in your life. Why is he doing it? Because he's developing you to be a joint heir with him. You see, I, I believe that those who will have some of the most important positions in the kingdom are those who have survived the toughest times here. And they learned their lessons of trust and faithfulness. And what does he say? Look at, look at verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. There's that righteousness, that practical righteousness we saw in these other lives. So that the man of God may be adequate. He'll be complete. He'll be mature, equipped for every good work. Those things that will bring us reward at the judgment seat of Christ. Do we believe those two verses? Do we believe that the word of God is the central, most important thing in our life? I was reading through in my, in my devotional time and was reading through Esther and this struck me at what Mordecai said to Esther. Whenever she was getting ready to walk into a situation where she could have been immediately killed by the king, even though she was the queen. Mordecai said, who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Who knows each one of us here online where you are, many tough places around the world. Why are you here? Because God placed you here for just such a time as this. Why is he allowing you to go through your tough times? Because he's preparing you. He needs you for just such a time as this, but also he's preparing you for ruling with him. That's why even though it's going to be the year of the unexpected, remember, God is the God of the unexpected, but it is never unexpected by God. Revelation 22, 20 says this, he who testifies to these things says, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for the.